What is going on, Macro Perspective peeps, man? I am super excited to have another episode and guest on today. But before we get into there, please like, comment, and subscribe. And you definitely want to share this one. Share this one with someone that is struggling with health or understanding of the food world. I think what we're going to get into is amazing. We've got a bit of a dossier here for our guest. And today we have Brian Sanders of Food Wise. Man, Brian, you know, our producer here has got a lot for us. You're doing a documentary. You've got like a sapien center out in Austin. You talk about food. You post up content around that stuff. And um, basically, the whole concept there is how humans should be eating, how we should be moving. Um, that's how I caught on to your content. And that's why I'd asked you to be here. Um, but without, you know, reading word for word this dossier, would you mind introducing yourself to the audience? Kind of what you're up to now, what you're excited about, my man. Thank you so much for being on, by the way. Sure, yeah. Uh, I love this stuff. I feel like now it's my job to communicate all this information. I've spent years of my life. It's been about nine years, 10 years now in my health journey. And in the past six years, I've done it professionally full time, just trying to understand what should humans eat and why is it so complicated? Why is it so conflicting? Why, you know, everything's like, completely conflicting so it's like oh man i know this guy went vegetarian and got healthy and then this dude went carnivore and went healthy what's the deal so part of, that's part of my quest is to figure out and also how to make fat loss simple and how to make it doable and how to get yeah change people's body composition change their health and have their problems go away get them off medications and this is all around my film series yes even food lies is my instagram it's also a film series. So that's why I've been so obsessed with it. And what I've been doing, I don't know, 60, 70 hours a week for six years, just trying to figure this stuff out, interviewed some of the top doctors and scientists around the world, my podcast called Peak Human. And while I've been doing the film and interviewing these people for the film, you know, I get them on the podcast as well, and just learn from them and just really, really amazing doctors and scientists. And I'm trying to get this really broad perspective where I take, I don't think anyone, one person has it figured out and I don't have it figured out either, but I'm trying to like take the best from each person I talk to and then try to make it into a worldview that fits everything and that doesn't have any holes or black swans, right? So an example of a vegetarian is they believe, or vegan, they believe that meat is not healthy. There's so many black swan. I mean, the, the entire world is a black swan to them, right? And, and and things don't make sense because there's people throughout all of history that have eaten meat and are super healthy. There are people who have eaten meat, only meat for 10 years and have only gotten healthier, right? Their theory just kind of doesn't work. And so I guess one of my overarching goals is to have a unifying theory that makes sense, that doesn't have any holes in it, doesn't have black swans, or, and then communicate it out to people, make it useful, make it actionable so that they can change their life. And yeah, so podcast, film documentary series, trying to get that on Netflix uh, in the early next year. We're working on it every day. I just got off a meeting just now. It's just constant work. It's basically trying to do a multi-million dollar project that should take 15 people to do entire, you know, Netflix quality film series. And we're doing it with two people and a few like Ooh. assistants that <laughs> are almost working for free. So huge endeavor. Wow. Wow. Um, man, that's a, that's a huge endeavor. I mean, me and Marco's here, you know, we talk about the macro perspective and bring per people guests on, you know, our backgrounds are in health and fitness, kind of like what you're, you're talking about. And it's like, you <laughs> it sounds like your endeavor is, is I feel like you're lifting such, you know, you're lifting the nation by its feet pretty much of trying to figure out what it is. And I, I like what you said there about, man, trying to figure out this stuff. It's, it's kind of hard, you know, People go vegan, people go carnivore. And I feel like with the day and age today, I think Marcos and I, hand in hand, are, are this is what we value, is giving information that, like you said, kind of works for the individual. Because like you said, no one really has it figured out. We're trying to figure this out too, because you're right. Some things don't work, some things do, but then there are these certain tenets that are like so extreme. And it's like, actually, so I think social media is going to, I think social media is like a double-edged sword, right, Brian? Or we've got people like you mm -hmm. who are trying to espouse truth and fact uh, based on actual evidence, and uh, and then you got people that are just 
trying to just throw things out there because it worked for them and they just believe in it, <laughs> um, which, you know, but it's so crazy how social media has gotten people to, to many extremes. You know, I always tell people, I don't want you to answer one extreme with another extreme. And I've been that person. I don't know if I told Marcos, but it's like, I've done the beat and I've done the carnivore and I've done this. And it's like, I've been on both ends of like being healthy and then unhealthy because of what the fad was. Right. So I love what you're doing, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Now it's trying to get through all, all of the noise and what works and what doesn't. And it kind of, it, hopefully we can, we can unpack this where it's like, there is a consistent thing that makes sense that all diets have in common. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not, hopefully by the end of the episode, people will be like, Oh, well, I get why someone doing a pescatarian diet can do it healthy. And someone doing a carnivorous diet can be doing it healthy. And they, they are actually using the same principles. So I don't think anyone's done a good job of showing why each of those work under the same paradigm. It took me forever to kind of figure it out that there, there is a paradigm that makes sense and why they, they both, they, they actually follow the same principles. Oh, there's so many, so many next questions with that question alone. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think precision nutrition does a good job of trying to outline this with one of their infographics. Um, what do all these diets have in common? I guess that's my question to you is like, mm. they ask that question, they put it, they put it together. There's the overlapping core principles, but like in your eyes, what do all what these is, diets yeah. have in common? Well, I should look at it. I've heard of precision nutrition, but I haven't seen this graphic, but maybe I could learn from it. I love taking in all the sources and uh, what they have in common is nutrient to energy ratio. That is okay. my kind of ultimate thing, nutrient to energy ratio. And yeah, there's that's layer one, which gets you 80% there. It's like 80, 20 rule. And then you, you go deeper and yes, you could be, Oh, let's talk about gut health and like how are we talking about individual like ingredients, you know, like there's different gums and you know, the glyphosate on the food, you know, you can get down into that level. Cause that that's not going to be in your, your general nutrient to energy ratio, but all good diets that ha what they have in common is that. And another thing would be whole foods, right? So that's pretty simple enough. It's like generally they're just built on whole foods and most whole foods have the correct nutrient to energy ratio. And if you look at plant versus animal foods, they're all different and some have more nutrients and more en some have more energy and it's fine. Uh, you know, for, for all of history, humans have gathered and hunted and gotten all these different foods and through our instincts that we, we do have these instincts for protein and nutrients we've gotten that correct ratio. And, you know, if we didn't get a hunt and we didn't have enough animal protein and fat, you know, we were always searching for more or we would try to get little tiny animals and eat them or, you know, collect eggs or collect seafood. We were always on the search for more animal foods. And then if we didn't have enough fat in those animals, then we'd be on the search for more honey and berries and carbohydrate sources, right? So it's like it w humans can naturally balance this nutrient to energy ratio. And, and I can explain that a little more too, but then yeah. what, I'll jump ahead to what happened with modern diets and the last hundred years is processed foods came in and that nutrient to energy ratio has been destroyed. It's been, it's like Franken foods. It's these, I have a lot of graphics that go along with this for the film, but this is kind of in the middle of the film, this main thesis of that these modern processed foods, they're, they're over, it's like going beyond the bounds of what humans have ever seen before in the, so, okay. I'll just explain the nutrient to energy ratio. Your body doesn't care the name of your diet. It just wants nutrients. It wants to get enough protein, vitamins, minerals, essential fats, right? And it wants the a right amount of energy to get through the day. And that can be from fats or carbs, right? Those are generally your energy sources. So right now, and for all of history, we got the right amount of protein, vitamins, minerals, right? The right amount of nutrients. And we got the right amount of energy because we just had whole foods. We got them from nature and we just can balance that naturally. Now, most people don't get enough protein, vitamins, minerals, and they get too much energy, right? This is goes into the calorie talk. Cal like cal all calories are not the same. That's insane. Uh, yes, you can lose weight by counting calories. And yes, you know, calories are, matter in, in some way. Energy calories matter, right? And that I think people need to differentiate the difference between nutrient calories and energy calories, right? So there's, you, you probably want more calories from protein and nutrients. 
usually you get the nutrients along with the protein and usually that's with animal foods and you get more bioavailable nutrients from those foods. And then from the, for the energy side, most people need to lose weight, lose fat specifically, and they need to eat less energy calories. So huge difference when just arbitrarily saying, let's eat less calories, which is terrible. So most people are just going to get less nutrients. <laughs> They're going to be arbitrarily lowering their calories. They're going to be lowering their protein intake, lowering their vitamins and minerals and being even worse off. And then they'll be on this yo-yo diet. And that's why, I, you know, whatever, 96% of diets fail. So yeah, I, I can, I can jump into this more, but th does that yeah. make sense from a no, that, level? That, that's a really good point. Yeah. I think like, I remember uh, a referral of mine from a client from before, um, she had a, she'd speak into like a doctor and she posts up on her Facebook, like my doctor just said, eat less, you know, eat less. And that's how I'm going to lose mm -hmm. weight. And I think that's a really like, as an arbitrary, like point, um, I guess the intent is good, but without the nuance, it's kind of there because I've had clients eat quote unquote more volume. Right. But the energy, like you're talking about, is so low, but the nutrients are so dense. I've even had clients losing, you know, tons of weight, eating nine pounds of food with water, of course, and other things. Um, and they're like, well, how, how is a person losing that much weight when they're eating up to six, seven, eight, nine pounds of food per day? It's like, well, because a lot of it's dense. A lot of it's nutriently dense. Nutrient it's day, good, yeah. it's good ground foods. It's good vegetables. It's good. And then, but it's like, but then you can look at someone that ate. I don't know. I don't like to demonize foods. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I try to work with mm -hmm. general population clients where it's like, you know, if you eat a certain, let's just say highly processed, highly palatable, highly caloric food, it could be this big, but the calories are like hyper insane. Right. And you don't mm -hmm. feel satiated. So it's like, you're very on the nose with that on the, on the tip of the nose there of like talking about like, Hey, mm -hmm. you know, that quote of like eating less doesn't necessarily, it's not a great, I don't think it's a great starting point. You really have oh, to have a good terrible. conversation, you know? No, no, it's it's terrible. I mean, we're going deep into this in the film and it can work in the short term. That's the problem. But health is not a short-term game. Health is a long-term game. The, this professor ate Twinkies and lost weight, right? Yep. To prove the point. I mean, I, I don't, some people think that he proves an opposite point. No, no, he proved my point. He proved the point that he was felt terrible. He was it was a ter he felt terrible. He uh, was starving the whole time. It was a nightmare. Of course, you can lose weight on just eating less. That, that doesn't make any sense. It's long term health is what matters. It's yes, it's all a long term game, and satiety is a huge part of that. Losing yeah. fat. And I, I don't, I always differentiate. You don't want to say losing weight. You can lose weight on the scale and that could be mostly muscle, right? That's what happens yep. if you go on like a, say a juice fast or you're, you're, go, you're just eating the wrong foods. Like high, Yeah. You could, the, the guy on the Twinkie diet, I don't know if they measured, like did a DEXA scan, but he would have lost mostly muscle. <laughs> well, actually, actually they, he actually did a, a blood work before and after with his mm -hmm. intervention. Um, again, he's a very smart individual and, uh, it got the, the article was written as the Twinkie diet, but it was really the gas station diet. Um, I listened to him on a podcast mm -hmm. and, um, he, there were some different rules and it was funny because in order to model health to his daughters, um, he would still eat some vegetables at dinner because he didn't want his kids to know that he was doing some outlandish, crazy stuff with like bad quote, bad foods. Yeah. Yeah. So it was anything that you can get at a convenience store. Um, I still think he had some macronutrient kind of goals with that. So he's eating beef jerky and things like that. Okay. But to your, to your point, um, he lost, he lost a good amount of body fat. He lost a good amount of weight. He actually improved his cholesterol. He yeah. actually improved a lot of his biomarkers and, but at an expense of constantly feeling hungry because the foods that we, he were, he was eating again was a Twinkie, you know, it's like two bites. Like, where are you getting any satisfaction? So oh, that's a good point in that nuance because I knew he did improve his blood markers, which is part of the story. Is that is part of the story? Is that if you lose body fat, most people have excess body fat, excess visceral fat around their organs. This is the bad fat. This they are not metabolically healthy. So any way you can lose that fat will improve your metabolic health, right? It's just a terrible way to do it, and it's not going to work long term. And there's and also these mineral and vitamin deficiencies are long-term things too. 
Yeah, your body stores a lot of them. It's not like you just die if you don't eat vitamins and minerals for two months or whatever, however long you did it. You know, you have years. Mm -hmm. There's people, vegans that last a couple of years and then they get all the deficiencies and, you know, feel terrible. So it's a, it's a long-term game. Uh, so yeah, I was going to say weight loss or fat loss is a, is a battle of hunger. That's why satiety is so important. I love these graphics. It's like there was a like an extra large pizza is like 3,000 calories. And then there was like three dozen eggs is 3,000 calories. You know, it's like, which one are you going to be full on? Like you, you can never eat three dozen eggs, but you could eat a big pizza. So it's stuff like that that, that matters most is you want to get – so for people who want to change their body composition, you want to get – all your nutrients for less calories, right? So if we are going to talk about calories, well, that's energy calories. So it's right. So if you're getting all your nutrients for less calories, that means you you have to eat super nutrient dense foods and eat less of the processed foods and less of the high energy dense foods, and you can still be satiated, right? I I could I've done this before. I you know I do all kinds of experience with, experiments with myself. It's like if I wanted to cut down a little bit, I would be eating steak, oysters, shrimp, fish, pickles, sauerkraut, stuff like that. So it's like I'm getting tons of nutrients and tons of protein from those meats and I'm not dumping butter on everything. And then I'm eating like lower calorie plant foods like pickles, sauerkraut, like I have like fresh, you know, jalapenos, just, you know, like a big jug of jalapenos from Costco. <laughs> I just eat the, I don't use sauces anymore either. That's another one. Don't use sauces. That's others just extra calories that are giving you no satiety. So I don't use sauces anymore because I can cook well enough for myself where the food tastes great. And I have say jalapenos on the side. I like I'm full, right? I'm eating a high volume of food, but it's just very nutrient dense. And so that's how you can lean lean out right is just get all your nutrients for less calories yeah and i think well this is the in our in our profession so we were health coaches um in multiple capacities and lanes one of the interventions that we're commonly um having to coach now is uh you know semaglutide and or Mm -hmm. like ozempic right the brand name um glp1 agonists which are they're increasing satiety signaling essentially because it slows down gastric emptying. And, you know, as a result, like we're, we're dealing with, we're combating a, a, a similar problem, like with a, you know, a different solution in a sense, but nonetheless, when people start eating that junk food, right. Quote junk food or food that is pretty void of nutrients, their bodies are like really rejecting it. We're seeing it time and time again with a lot of mm-hmm. our clinical people. And they're like, well, what am I supposed to be eating? And it's like, we have to go back to, Hey, like, this is what you talked about in the beginning. What do all diets agree upon? We need nutrient dense foods, things that are going to, you know, satiate you that are going to provide, you know, what your body's actually looking for. And you're going to have less room for the other stuff. Um, and by no means are these people, um, you know, exempt from the same rules and principles that you're talking about. Um, and, most commonly if they're just doing it based off of like food volume alone, like you said, the energy stance, um, there's a lot of other things that then start going on. Like I have a a theory that a lot of the um, quote coin terms that's in the media, whether it's like Ozempic face or Ozempic this or hair loss due to it is actually due to like thyroid dysregulation and things that are hormonally impacted right now that these patients are not monitoring properly with their doctors um, that I'm not saying that's our doctors. Our doctors are exceptional. Um, we are looking at biomarkers beyond mm-hmm. your wildest imagination to make sure mm-hmm. that those things are functioning appropriately. Um, but again, like, um, I mean, one of the most common ones for like thyroid functions, iodine. And most people are like, well, where do I get that from? Well, you we can get it from iodine salt or you can get it from some cranberries. But like, when's the last time you've been to a store and you actually saw cranberries? Oh, or seafood too. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> You yeah. just don't. And so like the only way for someone to even get like essential iodine is either supplemental form or cranberry juice. So like, you know what I mean? But then you're like, well, if a little is good, like two, literally two ounces of, of cranberry juice will supply you with like more than your daily value of essential iodine. Right. Mm-hmm. But like, then people are like, well, if, if a little is good, more is better. Right. And it's like, well, <laughs> that's my favorite yeah, one. Well, now that's you're favorite into one. In, well, now we're into that juice yeah. category, which is practically like sugars and similar to everything else. So like, 
I, I think like a lot of people like yourself, um, finding the nuanced way to articulate a very, a different approach to kind of trying to get to the same solution for health is super important. Cause like, like you just said, you didn't even know who PN was, but you instantly talked about like one of the graphics in my, that I envisioned in my head. And I'm like, I want to see if you're getting there with, even though you've never experienced or touched mm -hmm. any of their material, which, yeah. Well, yeah. Another thing with the Zempic type people, I think I know what's going on too, is maybe they're more satiated on less food, but they're getting less protein, vitamins, minerals, stuff that they need. And so that they're having lower thyroid function. So it's, it's like mm -hmm. a trick. It's like a hack, right? It's, so it's like, it's short circuiting in, in, in a wrong way. Right. So it's yep. like, it's allowing them to keep eating junk food, but not, they're just eating less junk. And now they're having the ramifications, right? The repercussions over that are the lower thyroid function. So it's like, my whole philosophy is to not use any of the medications, not use any of this. Well, I don't, I used to work with a doctor and actually like see people and health coach myself. And so I don't do that anymore, but I, I like, I, I do have enough experience to know like how this stuff works and mm. people do want the shortcuts, right? That they, they want to do that. But my whole thing is how do you do it without the medications, without trying to cheat nature? Cause I, I think there are no free lunches in nature. You can't, well, cheat yeah, nature. you're going to have, I agree. Problems. I mean, I mean, we're seeing that yeah. now. Lots of, um, I mean, there's just, just so many uh, freaking articles, and and we see there. So even before the articles came out, we've already seen that in our own practice, right? Of people talking about like, well, I feel like I always want to throw up. I feel like I can't eat the right way, or I feel like um, they're talking about paralysis. I haven't had any patients deal with that, but it's like, yeah, you're right. There is no free lunch with some of the stuff. It's like some of the stuff that if you're not aligning with nature or at least like your own way of doing things. Yeah. You can get that little bump and I appreciate the bump. Like some people, I, I agree. Oh, yeah. Some, some people, people really yeah. do need this. Some people, they need, yeah, the bump, but maybe. it's only, yeah. it should be in my opinion, like it should be for that term to get them. Okay. We've really reversed a lot of things. Okay. What are the lifestyle things that we can change now? Right. Well, what I think about that, what I was going to say about that is, you can do it naturally. So Zempic, yeah, you're talking about GLP-1 and like you're regulating your appetite hormones. Okay, you can do that naturally by using real foods. And it's hard, I get, right? It's not easy for people who are used to just eating all kinds of packaged foods. It's convenient, it's cheap, I get it. Fast food, packaged food, whatever. If, if you just start eating like a human again, and, and maybe it won't happen overnight, you will regulate your satiety mechanisms and all your hormones you will should regulate your thyroid function and, and all this stuff and you can do it naturally but it's just i guess not as as easy well, it's it's the modern times it's the whatever generation we're currently in um mm -hmm. and the instant gratification culture right it's uh it's why with Seamus's other job with porn reboot where people are addicted to porn because of the instantaneous access and it's no different with food and I think recently I heard the UK has actually surpassed the US in terms of uh, uh, obesity, in terms of the, their, their mm. epidemic, if I'm not mistaken. Again, I, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But nonetheless, um, in speaking to some clients that are in are international, they're like, oh, yeah, like afternoon is like, you know, tea and crumpets. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, crumpets are definitely like void of anything. It's just, you know, sugar. It's It's a pastry, yeah. right? Like. And uh, they're like, yeah, but that's like the, the norm. It's like, there's not a protein in sight. And I was like, oh yeah, well, it was only a matter of time before they could surpass us. I'm, I, I imagine mm -hmm. when I heard that uh, anecdotal story and it, it, it does fall into, um, you know, those fundamental principles that you mentioned, uh, I call them the axioms, right? Cause mm -hmm. it's really what it is. It's the foundation at which nutrition is really built. And again, we're not getting educated on it. We're, we're, we're we, it's not taught in health class anymore. You know, most people opt out of health, actually, if you're relatively gifted in, in education, like you can skip that class, so you can extra elective, so you can graduate with a 5.0 or 5.2 on, you know, weighted GPA. And uh, you miss over a lot of these like core principles that, uh, again, like you just said, like the longevity, like your, your health for, for life then is something that, you know, we completely miss out on the, some fundamentals. And um, I, this actually happened to me, but not with health per se it happened with math I, I skipped over a grade and a lot of my voids in my learning experience and academics because i was a math major 
I was like, why the hell do I not know this? It seems so basic. Like, they're like, no, you learned this in like seventh grade. I was like, oh, I skipped that class. Mm -hmm. And like, I had this hole of knowledge because the only thing I could go off of was, was my parents didn't teach me that. Right. And we know our, the parents of today aren't teaching, you know, <laughs> nutrition to their kids. So, you know, the pioneers like yourself, um, and many others have to do a job of like explaining that. And I know documentaries mm -hmm. like on Netflix get a lot, they, they get a lot of information out to people and they get a buzz around it. So I think like mm -hmm. your approach to like getting that is like going to be such an eye-opening experience because then people will be talking like, did you see the Food Lies documentary? It's going to be, you know it's gonna be epic. <laughs> well, I think I kind of thought about this. Yeah, it's like, what can I do to make the most difference? And it's kind of like hacking modern society. It's like, yeah, modern society, they're all about convenience and just, yeah, like pulling into a drive through and what's on Netflix. So I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. how, I, like there's other people doing other things like Nina Teicholz is making the Nutrition Coalition and she wrote The Big Fat Surprise. She's amazing. And she is in Washington, D.C. trying to change the law legislation and the, the guidelines, oh. dietary guidelines, right? And that's one way to do it. And I don't know if that's going to work. And it, <laughs> it's like kind of an uphill battle. And I'm talking to her new executive director. And he's like, oh, man, this is hard, you know? And it's a whole thing. I'm like, well, if there was just like an amazing documentary series that was really entertaining and fun and it explained it, like really well, that could make more waves than anything yeah. anyone could ever do in Washington, D.C. or with any law or with any food period it's a... or whatever. And mm -hmm. I don't think they're even teaching the right health to go back to what you're saying, uh, teaching it in school. I think that they're still in this paradigm of it's just calories and they're like, eat more fruits and vegetables. You know, it's like, whatever, you know, it's okay. It's, that's not like the worst advice to eat more fruits and vegetables, but that's not going to get people healthy necessarily. You need to like really think about stuff like nutrient to energy stuff that no one's talking about. There's a guy, Dr. Ted Naiman, who is great. And he's been talking about protein to energy for years and yep. years. And he's on Twitter and Instagram and doing his thing and wrote a book. And, and so we're trying to ex extend that to nutrients instead of, well, protein is like the main nutrient that I think is important for people to focus on. And then the, adding in the other nutrients is this stuff is not taught in the mainstream at all. Almost no one talks about it. Oh, in the, in the entire health world, even people who get in the health world, like there's Lane Norton, who some people like, some people hate. Uh, I I've been on both ends of the spectrum. Now now we're friends. He's in the film actually, uh, but oh. you know, like I, I he's really interesting because he I think he has a lot kind of correct, but he comes at it from this kind of bodybuilding angle, and yeah. you know he's just like at least, but he does differentiate protein from other yeah. nutrients and and energy right, and he. So there is something, but still, like, even he, the, I don't think, gets the, the correct nuance into, like, actually understanding that most people aren't out there lifting no. weights five times a week. They're sitting at office mm -hmm. jobs. You know what I mean? Like, you need to, like, meet people where they're at. They need to, they don't have, well, he actually has some good analogies, like a caloric budget. It's like a sports car. It's like, uh, if you if you're making a teacher's salary, maybe you don't have the budget to buy a sports car, but you know, some people do make a lot of money and they can buy a sports car. Right. So it's like these guys that are working out five days a week for multiple hours at a time, they yeah. can fit pop tarts in their diet. Right. And then that's back to your thing. It's like, we don't need to demonize all like certain foods. Yeah. I mean, if you like to eat pizza and you have your very active lifestyle and you eat pizza once yeah. a while, good for you. You know, and if you're feeling fit and you're eating good foods the rest of the time and you fit that in, that's great. Just so some most people aren't at the right body composition and don't yeah, yeah. Aren't, aren't active enough to. No, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate you bringing that up. I think that's what people need to understand about this podcast here as much as Marcos and you and I are about like health and about this side of the spectrum. For the audience listening, this is for you. This is for like the person the that's like, I don't really know. Yeah going on and I, I appreciate you bringing up lane because i think you posted this but he also posted it was that that lady going on the extreme vegan raw food diet and she passed you know and i think like your message i think my message aligns marcos is yours message aligns like we have to stop this misinformation right um just because there are people that are quote unquote dying and i know marcos has dealt with people <laughs> firsthand with someone with like an eating disorder um, my lady, she's a clinical dietitian and she sees people on hospice care. So like food, like 
I think there's a lot of fear around food right now, right? I, I grew up as a wrestler, Brian, and I had body dysmorphia and I had to try all the diets out because, mm. <laughs> you know, being body dysmorphic. So it's like, I feel like food has a lot of fear right now. And I appreciate that, you know, you, you bring, bring up Lane and you bring up this because it's, we, we have to find a way to bring information in that educates people. And not only that, at the top of the food chain too, politically, I guess it sounds like. Like uh, bringing up that lady that you brought up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, I think. Sorry, Brian. I think the 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 tether to Lane because Lane in his book Fat Loss Forever, at the base of his pyramid, which is adapt, adapted from Eric Helms. So again, really smart people. You know, deep mm-hmm. level of education and nutritional understanding. At the core of that is sustainability and adherence, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and I always you know, put that in like a presentation that I do with kids. And also whenever I do like an initial consult with anybody that comes through the door, I'm like, I need to figure out what you want to be doing a year from now. Like, I, I mean, I can give you, you could do a short term solution, but like, all right. So like, as you build up on this pyramid, it's like, you probably should resistance train. You probably need to do cardio. You need to figure out protein and total caloric intake. And then all the way at the top, you get to maybe some specialty supplementation. Again, depending on your dietary preferences, you, you might need to throw some additional things in there. And I think like, like you said, he, he, you, me, I, like, it, do, it doesn't matter. We're not going to get everything right. We're just trying to use the tools that, you know, are anecdotes or anecdata, you know, other you know, peer reviewed research um, and try to like articulate it in a manner that people can hopefully digest, I guess, pun intended um, mm-hmm. appropriately. And I think like you just said, like, um, I tell this to everybody now, it's like, we don't know what we don't know about nutrition uh, and biology. You know, we know a lot, but like who's to say that we don't crack the code in 10 years and it just all makes sense. And mm-hmm. literally they develop again, like not to, I know you're not like, Hey, I want you to go do pharma, but what if they figure out a drug that literally just makes energy void and just passes through you, but you can, mm-hmm. you know, get the new nutrients somehow. I mean, sounds like sci-fi, but mm-hmm. hell, I mean, Elon Musk shot a, you know, a space uh, on his uh, rocket. He shot a car up into, into space for no reason. So, you know, mm-hmm. I guess crazier shit could happen. <laughs> That's what it, yeah, yeah. I mean, I do think it, it might be hard to cheat nature, but uh, there, yeah, who knows? <laughs> um, so you have a background that's like completely left field of mm-hmm. this, though. So why get into this? Like you did something in tech, you sold a company, um, and and then you decided that you're, what 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 made you passionate about like health and understanding this deeper? Mm, yeah, well, I started as a mechanical engineer, so I did that for a while, and then I got into tech. I completely changed careers, and then I finally got into this health stuff. It was really when I around when I turned thirty, I lost both my parents. So they had these chronic diseases that everyone has. The doctors didn't tell them they were pre-diabetic. Uh, CDC admits that eight out of 10 people that have pre-diabetes don't know it, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> it's like, um, this is, I think, one of the hugest things ever. Like pre-diabetes, this is metabolic dysfunction. And if we're not recognizing it, of course, everyone's going to be fat and sick and get all these different conditions and and die early of, of any number of things. And I think that that kind of insulin resistance or the basically energy toxicity of people just eating too much energy is a root of all the chronic diseases, Alzheimer's, cancers, course, type two diabetes, you know, everything has this root in the metabolic health, which has a root in basically your body, you, you taking in too much energy calories and not enough nutrient calories. And Wow, I just thought of actually something that's really interesting that kind of explains a lot of this and why this happens for different people at different weights. Okay, a little yeah. tangent here before I get back to my story. Uh, that there's people in Asia, China and India have the most type 2 diabetes in the world, yet they have some of the lowest BMIs in the world, right? Relatively thin people, India, Chinese. That They have a low personal fat threshold. They do not have the ability to make more fat cells. This is sort of this genetic thing. So which means is they can get just a little bit overweight, right? Just a little bit, uh, store extra visceral fat, especially you can't see it really. Uh, and they can get sick 
right? They still have all these different diseases, type two diabetes and strokes and all this stuff, even though they're not super overweight. Then there's other people, Americans, a lot of the just white people, black people, just certain uh, Asian, uh, like uh, not Asian, um, like island Islander people, they can get really fat, but they still don't have type two diabetes yet because they genetically have the ability to make more fat cells. So they keep making more fat cells. So as they keep eating extra energy, they just can store it in extra subcutaneous fat, right? So then they don't start getting all the metabolic problems uh, as other people would. So I hope this is making sense is this is why people can be sick at different body weights. And it yeah. really does come down to visceral fat, which is, you know, the bad fat in and around your organs. And that really comes down to eating processed foods that have too much energy for the nutrients. Basically, your body can't do anything with this extra energy you're eating. And this is this empty calories notion too. Like my grandma taught me about this. My mom, you know, it's kind of like, don't eat empty calories. It's what you're talking about with the British and their tea and their crumpets. It's just empty calories, right? And that's a great concept that actually makes a lot of sense is if you're eating empty calories, you're, you're kind of screwed, mm -hmm. you know, and if you're eating these highly processed foods too much, you're kind of screwed. Of course, like Lane says, yes, you can have some if your budget allows. Most people's budget doesn't allow for it. And so even if you, you could be semi thin, but you have tons of visceral fat and you could be metabolically damaged and you could still have these problems. So that was a little tangent, but th that's kind of what happened with my parents and what was happening with me. So they were not super obese. They were the standard Americans that just gained a pound a year and they had prediabetes. Now, now I'm looking back and no one told them. And then for my mom that manifested in Alzheimer's and for my dad, just being, you know, just eating the wrong things just slowly gave him cancer. And I think it was a metabolic, I think uh, a lot of cancers yeah. are a metabolic problem. And so that woke me up, right? So I was 30, lost both of them. Uh, I was turning into the dad bod, you know, skinny fat guy, trying to do the right things, eating the food pyramid, eating, you know, what the food pyramid said. I was eating like your whole whatever. grains. With the, yeah, whole <laughs> grains. Yeah, whole grains and uh, lean meats and just trying to do all that. And it just didn't work. And I just think that. When you actually do the math on those foods, they aren't nutrient dense. They aren't there. You're, you're still getting too much energy and not enough nutrients from those. So I, without trying, I was just slowly overeating on the energy side and not getting enough nutrients. And there, there's a satiety component too, where it's just, if you're eating these foods that are not very nutrient dense, you just have to eat more of them to get to the same nutrients. Like I was saying before, your body, humans and all animals have instincts on what to eat. And so you just are going to overeat. It's well, there's the protein leverage hypothesis. People probably have yeah. heard of that listening. It's a, all humans or all organisms eat to get to a certain amount of protein. And if your food that you're given is lower in protein, you're just going to have to eat more of it to get it. And I think that extends to nutrients. I like the nutrient leverage hypothesis that isn't really talked about much, but that's what happened to me. So I changed my diet around 30 years old to just more nutrient dense foods like looking back it's like okay instead of eating bread and pasta i just ate i don't know more meat and i ate uh, like i sauteed mushrooms and onions something like that so that i cut out a lot of excess empty calories and so without counting calories or worrying about macros i spontaneously changed my entire body composition and changed my health so all i did was up my nutrient to energy ratio basically eating more of these nutrient dense foods, less empty calories. And I never had to count calories. I was always satiated and it just happened. And, and yeah, that's kind of my stories where I did this, felt great, thought it was very easy and just kind of wanted to tell the world. Man, that I think, the, I think there's always a pivotal moment for most people. Um, and lucky for you, it's like, you didn't have to, ex you experienced it like, I guess, technically adjacent, right? Like you didn't personally um, go through that, but obviously it's impacted you in a way to be like, okay, well, I need a, I need to have a new definition of sickness, right? Because obviously like this, you know, like silent killers, right? Um, 
it, you I think a lot of people don't understand it, right? Like they, because they don't have the sniffles or a cold that they don't think that they're sick. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that, um, a, a great kind of reference point would be like the sickness, wellness, fitness continuum. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that it, I mean, CrossFit adapted mm -hmm. it, but the, it, it does a good job of like, again, we have sickness on one side, wellness is in the middle. We should strive for wellness. And then fitness is like giving you increased protection from a bunch of different things. Right. And so like the question here, right. Like is like to all the listeners, like what is sickness? Well, sickness could be a myriad of things that you're probably not considering high blood pressure, body fat being too high, bone density sucking, your triglycerides being off, your cholesterol ratio being bad, right? Or high cholesterol in, in total, right? Elevated hemoglobin A1C, right? Not having enough muscle mass and so many other things that could be applied. And so if, you, if you're if you striking out across the board, you may actually be, quote, sick in like this new this new era, like this Renaissance period of of, of like wellness, right? And then, you know, we're striving to figure out like where, where do you actually fall where all those things fall in line in a continuum, right? So I think um, I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm skeptical about like blood work for a lot of people because it's a, it's a working average of a generally unhealthy population, mm -hmm. right? Like we're, we're creating an average like for testosterone based on people that are, again, on statistically on average, they're going to be obese and they're going to be unhealthy and probably have at least two co comorbidity factors um, associated with it that they don't know because, well, we know men don't like going to the doctors for a checkup mm -hmm. because, <laughs> you know, then you have to face it. Um, but yeah, like that continuum when, when like getting older, right. I just turned 30 a couple months ago. Um, and I used to bring that into my consult with people and explain that. And I was like, eh, like I was just kind of like, you know, not paying too much mind to it really just focusing on the X's and O's. But now that there's like kind of a way to explain it a little bit deeper, and like classifying people as sick right away, like out the gate when they come in, they're like, I've never considered that as part of being sick. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like your parents example there. Um, what, you know, the underlying cause was this metabolic dysfunction. Um, and again, um, like, Brian, how long ago was that out of curiosity for Did you uh, lost your parents? Well, I'm four. I just turned 40. So 10 so years ago. This is 10 years yeah. ago. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how, I know hemoglobin A1C is newer. I know that like it hasn't been classically on a, a blood work panel. Um, I know it still really isn't um, for uh, a general like requisition form. Um, but right there, it's like someone might wake up and fast and look all right, but then they're, you know, they're, ele they're, they're pre-diabetic or type two. And like mm -hmm. you just said, unbeknownst to them, they're now dealing with that high level insulin resistance. And you're right, like in our practice, we tell people every time, it's like, Hey, you're, you're pre-diabetic. Like what? Like, mm -hmm. like there's, there's no symptom per se. Like oh, they, they the feel problem. Yeah. <laughs> there's not really a symptom and you look like everyone else, but yeah. then there's all these stats, like 88% of the U S is metabolic unhealthy. Then there's another one by Tufts. 93% are not metabolic unhealthy more recently. And mm -hmm. yeah, that that's whatever you're comparing to. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it's alarming. Um, it continues to be something that like people like yourself and pioneers that are trying to find a way to get people to, again, you educate yourself that you can, so you can go then inform yourself on whether or not you fall into that criteria. Um, and uh, again, um, I think unfortunately we've all learned and we see this over and over again. Um, well, my insurance won't pay for it. It's like, well, uh, like, can you spare like a hundred dollars, you know, or 150 to get a pretty complete metabolic panel, mm -hmm. you know, like, and I, I do this with my clients that are outside. I'm like, okay, if you really want to do a deeper dive, we can. And it's like 150 bucks and you can do this once a year, maybe twice, um, get an understanding of what's going on under the hood. Right. And the beautiful part is, is like, um, your insurance can't deny you this cause you're going to go pay out of pocket with like the lab itself. Um, they are a business and they legally cannot ask for that information. It is yours and you're protected. Um, and so a lot more people are like now taking a lot more ownership and I'm being an advocate for them to take ownership in their health because they need to, they need to know for longevity purposes. And, uh, yeah, I wish, I wish everybody can have that luxury, but again, like, um, my job as a coach and working with people, I 
I ask questions that go beyond probably the scope of my job. And I'm like, let's look at your finances. Mm -hmm. Like, are you employed by somebody that offers an HSA? Can you like take out $50 a paycheck so you can do a lab every quarter? You know, complete a, a complete mm -hmm. workup essentially. Um, and also I tell them they get a tax incentive and they're like, how do you know all this stuff? I was like, it's my job to know this, to help you, honestly. <laughs> well, that's great. And also some people will like just blow 150 on a dinner or, you know, they'll just like go out. That's, and, that's the best and, like, post, Brian. I, don't have any I, money think, for this I think I said something along the lines of like, what did you do last it's, week? It goes like this. It's like, oh, um, it's like ah, healthy groceries. Nah. But you know, that fancy dinner all day. It's like. Oh, uh, read a book that's going to help you with your finances, binge Netflix. Yeah. You know, it's like all these like different dichotomies of, of examples. It's so true. It's, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard bargain. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know how to undo it too. And that's modern culture though. It's like, how do you undo the entire, entire modern culture? It's hard. I don't know. I don't know. It's conversations like this. <laughs> well, yeah. I have a, one solution yeah. is, well, it's, What's yeah. Learning and well, finding new people to hang out with. I think that's a big one. Yes. It's your environment, right? Oh, uh, you left I, me. <laughs> I left LA. Uh, not entirely for this many reasons. Many reasons why I left LA, but uh, I have a new crew here in Austin, and everyone's on the same page. And you mentioned the Sapien Center. Yeah, I have this place where people live by these values, and it's amazing because people join. And they're just looking for a place to do sauna and cold plunge or something, or they just want to do co-working. And then all of a sudden they're losing weight. They're getting fit. Like it's incredible mm. because they're just around these people that are into it. And so instead of on the weekends on getting some dinner and like getting drunk, we have just hangouts and we just don't drink. And <laughs> we got to come out to Austin, hang with you. Stuff. Cause I'm, I'm you know, in LA it's, and it's, it's very, amazing. That, that's very much the scene, right? Like um, if you're kind of in like, the L I'm in the Beverly Hills area and like Hollywood and all that. It's like very much like people want to go out. They want to do the thing. Um, you got to create your own community like around that. Like the people that I keep around me are like, no, we're going to the beach. We're going to get some, you know, some time in the sun. We're going to go lift some weights. It, you, I feel like in this modern Asian culture, you have to be kind of actually adamant about who you spend your time with and your time, uh, especially in LA culture. Just, I know, you know, the LA culture. Right? So it's like, you got to have to be. For sure. Yeah. Mm. Well, I got it's, out of it. I was at Venice Beach, but yes, I had to get out of there. Uh, cult, yeah, community, the, the, you're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. You're the sum of the five things that you listen to most as well. So like, you know, um, parasocial influences, social influences. And like you just said, like those people, they're like, if they're sticking out like a sore thumb in your, your sapien center, right? Like, mm -hmm they're going to be like, all right, what's everybody else doing to look this way? And like, why are they so freaking happy and gung ho all the time? And I'm the asshole in the corner, like just in a yeah. bad mood. It's contagious, but in a good way. Um, and it's, I mean, that's a dope co-working space. So you can go cold plunge, you go hit a sauna and then go back to work. <laughs> we do it all. Yeah. I need to go there now. It's, it's a dream. <laughs> like we have, yes. It's, I, I think these need to be everywhere. People need to find their own version of these everywhere, but that, it, yeah. Is it a is it a franchise? Can we franchise it? Because I, oh, I mean, I'll take I'm one to Vegas. Working on it, an official <laughs> franchise costs a lot of money to set legally. Just to set that whole thing up, it's it's insane. But I'm trying to figure out how to get these. We have requests in Florida, uh, Denver, you know, Nashville. We're we're figuring it out. Maybe yeah. I should connect you with uh, one of our patients that does franchising with a bunch of different kind of co working models because he'd probably go gangbusters over this one. Got to. Oh yeah. Got to give, I got to reach out to him. Seriously. Like he probably, yeah. he has the capital and he loves great ideas. He's always looking for investments. So, I mean, who, what better way to like do something that's so unique and niche? Like it's, I, I mean, sign me up. Like, I, I mean, well, there's, there's it. such, <laughs> I'm just waiting for people to, that there's all these people like through my podcast and Instagram and stuff, people keep reaching out to me and it's like, I'm waiting to identify the right people to do it. Like we kind of need community builders who are, mm -hmm you know, I can't be there. It's like, we need people. So yeah. if, you, if you're listening, yeah, like reach out to me, reach out to you guys. And it, I think it's super important. It's, it's kind of the last piece of the puzzle because I'm really into the ancestral stuff. You know, like what did we do for 99% of human existence? That's probably what's going to work for us. And so with the food stuff, it's, yeah, we ate animal foods, we ate meat and eggs and fish and whole foods and 
It was great. We moved, we got in the sun, we did all these things. Like people know this stuff, but the last piece of the puzzle was the community aspect. And I don't think people yeah. have that. And that there's this concept of third spaces or third places where we used to have that even like a hundred years ago, where it would be like the local pub, but it, it would be the library, it'd be the town square, stuff like that, where people would go and actually interact. And you would have just, you know, these places where you can develop strong community bonds and all that type of stuff. Now we don't have that. Now yeah. we just have like people getting wasted on sixth street. That's oh, Austin reference, but you know, it's just like a million <laughs> bars and, that's not that's that's trauma that's bonding like, that's trauma building. bonding <laughs> that's like so, yeah they, they, over they, some they, drinks <laughs> yeah it's like humans need that last piece so it's what we're talking about it's people around you that believe in the same thing and want to have your back and and yeah even like the blue zones i think the blue zones are a little bit bogus it's a guy that went around the world with a yep. bias towards a vegetarian diet. And he like did a lot of shady stuff to try to find vegetarian populations. But what he did find was people, well, they ate whole foods. So actually it wasn't even so bad, right? He found a bunch of people who were eating whole food diets, right? So that's a huge step up from everyone else. And they, I think what, and they were moving, they were, you know, they're doing a lot of good things like walking and outdoors and stuff, but they were also, a, a big sense of purpose and family and connection. And that was a huge component of it. So I think that's just a missing piece that a lot of people don't talk about. You, you hit the nail on the head though. Like the, we're looking at it as like the golden ticket to the diet, like the only food they ate. People don't consider the lifestyle as part of your nutrition. Like mm -hmm. anybody I know that's going to a, like Italy or going to a, you know, somewhere in the Mediterranean, they're like, they're, they, so, I mean, I have them track like their movement and they're like, I walked like 24,000 steps every single day while I was there. I actually came back weighing less than I did when I went there. Like what gives the food is higher quality. It's like, mm, no, you probably had a better energy balance. Like, you know, you were actually like putting it to work and it, it you see those, you know, 90 year old or hundred year old people um, that are, you know, in that demographic. And they're like, yeah, we're they They walk their ass over to the pub. They have a glass of wine. They eat a quality whole food meal. And then they would walk home at 90 years old. Mm -hmm. Tell me somebody in the U S that is doing that. Oh, no, not, like, they're going to a strip, they drove to a strip mall to go to Applebee's and then they yeah. home. or in Vegas, they drive to GVR or a casino yeah. at the local, the local spot. Our culture, and then they, you know, get their I mean, it's also hard too, Brian. I think you know, like, same, I same, love, same, like what you're same bringing thing, up there, but... Marcus, I think like also like <laughs> the thing to understand too, is like the socioeconomics of it. Like certain cities, it's just, the safety is just so different, mm -hmm. right? You know, we talk about that too. I've, I think we talk about this in our precision nutrition class environment. They ask about, hey, could you tell me about your environment? Is this an area you feel like you can walk around safely to mm -hmm. get your steps in? Or like, um, do you feel like you can walk down to the store? It's like, I never even thought about those questions until recently because it's like, yeah, we talk about community and things like that. What if your community outside your doors, you know, you're outside your doors of your home is like not a community you want to be part of, right? Um, and that makes safe, that makes your health difficult, right, Brian? Just makes your health so difficult. Well, the stress, stress has a really physical manifestation that a lot of people don't realize. Like I know that stress, like if I drive, driving in LA was a nightmare and I have physical stress, physical pain in my upper back and neck, right? You know, it's, I'm just like stressed out driving, like physical pain. And there are studies uh, I, I can't quote them all, but they do look at people eating and stress and it's very different. Their blood sugar is different. Their like digestion is different. Like how you're, you're living and, and eating and everything about it, super dependent on stuff like your environment, your stress, like even just, yeah, dri driving in the car and eating, like that's the worst way to eat. It's like your body's in like fight or flight, you know, like just in general, like, what are we doing in this vehicle, like barreling down a freeway? Well, that's why everybody moved out of California during COVID. They're like, F this, like, uh, <laughs> I'll find a place where I don't have nearly as much stress when it gets back to normal. Yeah. But you're, you're right. Like, um, I think the, the craziest thing is that in working under some other, um, you know, like high level bodybuilding coaches, as an example, um, their interest in like functional medicine, 
like in, in functional nutrition, as they will now mm -hmm. so call it, um, people at the top level, they're approaching it with very, very much so in a, in a synergy. Like they've already understood the macros, but they're like, oh, there's like deeper root causes, right? And they're, mm -hmm. they're getting to causalities. And um, yeah, younger coach me was like, why does this matter? I just want my people to lose fat. And then they're like, you're not getting it, Marcos. Like this, this is the reason behind it. And it, again, it's the, the, the physical manifestation of stress and it's the, mm -hmm the poor nutrient quality and it's, you know, food selection. And, uh, one of the questions I'll never forget. I asked a client was, she's like, well, like I'm eating all this healthy stuff. And I was like, okay, what do you define as healthy? And she's like, well, you know, like my parents have cooked with like oils and, you know, uh, it's like, it's extra virgin olive oil. And it's, you know, all these things that again, like on paper look great. And then I just simply asked the question and what do they look like? And mm -hmm. then she sat there, thought about it for literally like 30 seconds. She's like, no one ever put it that way. None of them have, a healthy image or the image that I'm trying to, trying to achieve. And I was like, so why are you replicating what they're doing? And that was like the, the saving grace moment of like, I know I need to listen to you now because you now pointed out like the obvious, like the, the, the environment around me is not actually healthy, even though I'm perceiving it as healthy. And I think this is a, uh, I don't know if it has like a, a bias, like your parent bias or your, like a healthy parent bias, or you're assuming mm -hmm. your parents are going to feed you things that are supposed to be nutritious, mm -hmm. but most kids growing up, maybe the parents are just feeding them what they can afford. And then, you know, the, in steps, you know, us or not having that intervention or, or conversation about food, like, like you're describing Brian. And, um, it, it's why, like, I've become so passionate about really getting, uh, the nonprofit uh, off the ground and trying to make this big lift into getting into schools and getting to kids at an age where I think they, they're impressionable enough. They are mm. willing to learn. And uh, again, getting kids out of class to like talk about food and then eat is probably a cool experience that people would really like to do. So that's like how I've been piggybacking that proposition um, and hope to continue to do more with it. Cause you know, it, it is us. It's like, we're the pioneers of like just showing simple stuff, honestly, like make it damn simple. Um, everybody has their intellectual property around maybe their own like diet spin a lot of them are great, you know, pick the one that like they all resonate in some, some, uh, some center frequency. They just have little spins to it. Hey, like before you're going to go, you know, go be feast mode, you got to go beast mode. You got to go for a long walk or you got to go do something strenuous before you actually go get the food in like you're hunting. Right. And I was like, mm -hmm. that's a good principle. I like that idea. Um, the other one is, uh, you know, like Tim Ferriss talks about like the slow carb uh, carbless diet or whatever his approach is. And he basically like gets rid of anything slow carb diet. There you go. And he's like, I strip anything that's white out and like kickstart me, you know, cause you're going to have a natural tendency to probably gravitate back to that for convenience at some point in time. So like, every time I do that, I, I feel great. And you know, then reality sets in and you, you know, you start to have a little bit more, a little less control, which is fine. But I think that's, that's the problem is that no one's, understood it at a level that they can go back to. They don't want to, they want something new and shiny. Um, and again, working with some of my previous clients that come back to me, like I got nothing new for you, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, there's nothing shiny here. It's, the, it's just getting you to figure out how we got to work in your current lifestyle. Um, and, uh, you know, then, then the deep conversations and deep health begin. What do we need to fix first? You know, um, how do, like, and how do we build community? How do you translate like what's going on with with you to me uh in a, in a way that it'll help us make actionable change and um yeah that's why i used to hate the role i used to hate the title coach i was like i don't want to be a freaking coach mm -hmm. but now i actually really love it because it's like it, it's it's turned into so much more um because those are the people that can really make a dent in people's life for a long period of time so yeah i like it it's all the long-term um, game i'll tell you <laughs> Yeah, like we're all we're, we're all student of something. We're all being coached in some way, shape, or form. You know, you're you're being coached right now into like how to get your, you know, your series into a place. I'm sure people are like, hey, you need to hit these notes, and they're coaching you up on like the key words and the buzz mm -hmm. things that need to be propositioned to like the network people, right? Like mm -hmm. you're all, you're always being coached to some capacity. So that's why I used to not like it, but I'm like, ah, now that I think about it, I'm always being coached. I need to be coachable, and I used to be a terrible. You know, Makes sense. Um, Brian, we are hitting so, the hour yeah. mark. I don't want to take up more of your time. You've already given graciousness um, with so much. Um, would you mind just telling the audience 
how far you're into the film, how close you guys are getting done, where they could get it, and anywhere else they can find you and anything else that you're passionate about. Yeah, well, it's been a long process. It's been six years making this film. We've rewritten it like probably six times. Uh, we're in the final version. Get, we're finishing the first episode so we can pitch it around. We have like four distribution companies that want to represent us to get it onto all the major platforms or just, I guess, Netflix. I don't know if you can do multiple platforms, but uh, yeah, long road. Went to Africa, went all over North America, just interviewing the best and the brightest uh, food lies on Instagram. And you can, you can check out the, or you can still back the film. Actually, we, we are allowing people to pre-order it so you can get it early and, you know, and have your own copy. And it just really helps us because it's just two guys trying to do it on our own. Admirable. And we'll make sure we have the, that link in the show notes for people to pre-order and support. Cause um, I've seen the influence time and time again. I get, you know, as the, as the nutrition coach in the family, everybody's like, what do you think about game changers or blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm like, mm, like, I was like, here's, here's the principles as I know it. Like, mm -hmm. um, and then people will then come back and change their tune after they, when they start feeling better, like you mentioned, you know? Um, and I think this is, I mean, this is something that I know Seamus and I, yeah. were like, I, I, I hope this movie hits kind of like yeah, we, we know we need this. Um, and I think <laughs> oh, it's going huge. No, it's going huge because this is all the world needs. No one's going to do all the research that you guys have done or I've done and like go to conferences and listen to a million hours of podcasts and listen to uh, audio books and read. You know what I mean? It's no one's going to do that. You've seen that, right? The, so what people will do is watch a six part series. They're, the episodes are like 30 minutes. It's super fun. And like, it's like infotainment, you know, it's digestible content and it'll teach them everything and it'll show them why the game changes is wrong. And it'll show them why, you know, like you, people just need to understand how food works. And if you, if you have a solid understanding of just of like how food works, like we talked about in the beginning, why different diets can work that seem opposite. Well, what is, what is the commonalities? Then hopefully if they're paying attention. I, that's why we're taking so long to do it is because we're trying to make it just so perfect and every word counts. They'll know how to do it. And then they won't have to get tricked by the next vegan propaganda film that comes out. Or they, or they can hear about some new fad where it's like, oh, well, you do this and you avoid white foods. That's perfectly fine. I get it because those are empty calorie foods. You know what I mean? Like, like, these, like if most things that are white could be just sort of non-nutrient dense sort of filler foods. So if you get rid of those, right? So like that Tim Ferriss thing, that makes sense. And people be like, ah, okay, so this is, I mean, it might be a fad, but I get why it works, right? That's what I want to, it's the whole teach a man to fish instead of just giving yep. the fish. I love so, it. Yeah, that's the goal. We're doing it. It's taking a long time, but we're in the home stretch. Labor of love, man. We, we get it. I mean, we never envisioned having someone you know, like yourself on here when we first started. And uh, with each passing guest, it's like people are doing some amazing stuff out there and we can't wait to like watch them explode. Um, and we're just happy to like, again, steal an hour of your time and get, let people know like what, what's of interest to different minds out there and how it's going to make a difference in the world. So we really appreciate you being here. Um, we know that um, again, work is going to be amazing. Uh, and again, for everybody listening to this episode, um, down below, we have everything in the show notes to make it nice and easy and clickable because someone's probably going to make a typo somewhere. You uh, know, so we'll save uh, you that hassle. Brian, just and, uh, really appreciate your time. Yeah, you, know, you have any other closing remarks? On Instagram, DMing you. And you said yes. So really appreciate that. And I'm glad that you're so gracious enough to give us that mm -hmm. time. But also at the same time, it aligns with our message. You know, the macro perspective really is about giving people the nuance, the right stuff, and making sure we get the right people on here because at some point we need to battle misinformation and battle all these things. So for the audience listening, thank you so much. Thanks. All right, guys. everybody. We'll see you on the next episode of The Macro Perspective. Until next time.